So my talk today is called Timing It Can Be Everything, Femina at the Musée de Québec. In April 1944, Montreal artist Paige Piano wrote to Paul Rainville, curator of the Museum of the Province of Quebec, wondering if he would consider her for a solo exhibition. Rainville knew her work and politely wrote back saying, unfortunately, he had too many requests for individual exhibitions, but he was thinking of doing a group show of work by women artists. Did she have suggestions? Piano, well connected in the Montreal arts community, wrote back suggesting painters Ethel Seath, Anne Savage, Nora Collier, and Mabel Lockerbie as good choices. All four of her suggestions were Beaver Hall artists Piano, who was from Nova Scotia, was not. However, as she'd come to the city in the late 1930s, but she'd quickly become a part of the community as a teacher, a writer on art, and a frequent exhibitor. Rainville ultimately created his own short list of artists and included Piano, but not any of the other suggested participants. Femina, as the exhibition would come to be called, included Sculptor Sylvie Daoust, Sylvia Daoust, whose work included realistic sculptural portraits of living people and subjects from biblical stories that were often created for churches. Simone Denechaud, painter of landscapes, still lifes, and portraits, who was very involved in teaching through the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and the Catholic School Commission in Montreal. Suzanne Duquette, painter of angular, high-keyed colored portraits that challenged the viewer with a direct gaze. She taught at the University du Québec à Montréal and would later be involved in radio and television programs about the fine arts. You'll learn more about her in a paper this afternoon. Claire Fauteur, who'd been in France when World War II began and was arrested and sent to a camp at Bessacan and then at Vital. While detained, she made drawings of her surroundings and later used them as the basis for charcoal and gouache illustrations. Agnes Lafort, painter of brightly colored portraits and frequent exhibitor in Montreal exhibitions, who taught at Miss Edgar and Miss Cramp's school, but would leave the profession in the 1950s to start her own galleries. Marion Dale Scott, whose work was on the cusp of abstraction as she explored city themes, as well as natural forms from close up views of flowers to cells and fossils. Plus Georgiana Page Piano, the watercolor painter whose letter to Rainville may have been the germ behind the idea of the show. A writer and an educator, she taught for many years in the Protestant high school schools. Sculptor Alice Nolan and painter Prudence Heward had been invited as well, but declined for personal reasons. Painter Marguerite Femelle objected on principle to being asked to pay $17.65 to support the printing of the catalog and invitations, as well as the cost of the opening reception. Femina opened on February 10th, 1947 in Quebec City with 140 works by seven women from Montreal. As documented in installation photos, the exhibition was in a series of galleries at the museum, which allowed for breathing room between the works of art, making it very different from the crowded annual exhibitions or the displays at department stores. The works by the artists were interspersed rather than presented artist by artist. Reviews were complimentary and the museum purchased a number of works by each artist and the whole series of 30 works by Vauteur. It was a success. The exhibition was not the only major show of art by women that year. The National Council of Women spearheaded a show at New York's Riverside Museum in spring 1947 called Canadian Women Artists and a number of the participants in Femina were included. But Rainville's choices for Femina, all experienced artists of note demonstrated a breadth of expression in Montreal art the opportunity offered distinction and prestige in being one of the artists selected, a small exclusive group. However, as far as I can discover, the exhibition, while an important event in the lives of the seven artists, it was not a breakthrough and did not offer a major boost to the careers of any of the artists. While my colleagues Esther Trepanier and Sandra Pakowski have included Femina in their writings about the 1940s, 
In the larger survey histories of art in Canada, Femina has merited only a brief mention, if it's mentioned at all. So why wasn't Femina a milestone? I believe it's for two reasons. The fact that the artists had so little to tie them together and timing. The artists in Femina, Daoust, Denichaud, Duquette, Fauteur, Lefort, Piano and Scott did not share a common background, common education, common approach, common first language, or common media, making it harder to see them as a group. When artists share an approach or a style, something more than simply gender and where they live, there's a stronger possibility of a second exhibition or even a third that cements the importance of the group. Certainly the prestige of being selected for this exhibition was an achievement for these artists and many sold works out of the show, but it was a moment, not an event that would transform their careers. Ironically, if the artists had more in common, rather than being selected because the curator found each of them individually to be noteworthy, Femina the sequel might've been possible and made sense. And then there was the timing. In the late 1940s, everywhere society was changing. At universities, World War II veterans were being encouraged to get professional educations, as were women. New suburban housing for this generation was changing the face of cities across Canada. And everywhere consumer culture was on the rise with its labor-saving machines, along with canned and frozen food that would revolutionize the tasks at home. It was time to learn to be modern. In New York, a group of abstract artists were calling us, calling attention to themselves and making news, not just locally, but soon globally, supported in large part by color magazines that reached not only artists, but the general public. Closer to home, McGill University was beginning a new bold BFA program, albeit taught by men rather than the women who dominated the field of high school art teaching. Everything seemed to be changing. By far, the most important event we speak of when we remember art in Quebec in the late 1940s is the publication of the Manifesto Refus Global, a blueprint for the rejection of traditional Quebec society by a group of artists called the Automatistes, whose own work was influenced by surrealism and abstraction. While not an immediate thunderclap, the Refus Global has come to be emblematic of the changes that we now see were developing just under the surface in Quebec at the time. When we look back at the works in, of art in Femina, they seem more connected to the previous generations of artists than to the contemporary spirit of the time. Today, the works by most of these artists can be found in many museum collections, though perhaps not always on view, with the exception of one, Paige Piano, whose work is much less widely distributed. It's in the Musée National des Beaux-Arts de Québec, the Musée Brook in Cowansville, uh, Quebec, but I haven't found it in other uh, public collections. As the artist whose correspondence with Rainbill may have been the spark behind the idea of a women's art exhibition, she's less well-known, less documented, and less discussed in the literature than her six colleagues. She, however, gave her archive to McGill University and her documentation about her own work and about art in Montreal was a great leap forward for my research. We've talked a lot at this conference about the importance of archives. And I would add that for anyone interested in further research on art in the mid 20th century in Montreal, about exhibitions, about the teaching of art in high schools and what was discussed in the periodicals, Paige Piano, ever a teacher, has left us a gift. Thank you.